Hello again, everyone. Uh, hope you all have been having a great day. I sure am. Uh, there's so much I've learned since morning. Uh, but uh, next talk is the one which I'm most excited about. I may sound a bit biased, but it's my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce Bindu Reddy as our next speaker. Bindu is going to talk to us about entrepreneurship and women leadership. She will share a lot of amazing stories from her own journey. Uh, what does it take to be an entrepreneur, uh, particularly women entrepreneur challenges? So I'm super excited. Uh, there is so much about her amazing background, but I don't want to take a lot of time for her background. So just a couple of quick uh, thoughts, uh, uh, quick points about her background. She's currently CEO and co-founder of an AI startup, Abacus.ai. They recently got their CDC funding. So congratulations, Bindu and the rest of the team on that. We are very happy for you. Uh, prior to this, she has also co-founded another company which was acquired by Uber. Uh, she has held senior level positions with Amazon and Google. Bindu is also a very proud alum of IIT. She went to IIT Bombay for her BTEC and she did her master's from Dartmouth. With that, let's give a very warm Bay Area style welcome to Bindu. Uh, Bindu, so take it away. Well, thank you so much, Pallavi, for that fantastic introduction. Very nice to meet all of you all. And thank you all for coming uh, to this conference on a Saturday. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I have a little deck, nothing too fancy, but uh, I'm going to just start, you know, get going. Hopefully, you guys can see it. All right. Okay, so I was very uh, touched and, uh, you know, honored to be, uh, you know, uh, asked to do this talk about around women entrepreneurship and leadership. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story, my journey, kind of the issues I faced, both both positive and negative in some in some sense, and how, uh, you know, that has shaped my life so far. And also kind of a little bit about how I think we can at least address some of the negative issues, at least for the women and the girls of today who are in, in high schools or in college and so on. So a little bit about my story, Pallavi already told you, gave you my resume, so to speak, I'm going to just get into a little bit of my childhood. Um, I uh, grew up in Bangalore. Uh, and uh, we were a middle class family, uh, we were actually quite conservative, uh, women didn't really leave their houses to go to various different uh, places for college, at least nobody had done that. Uh, for me, my parents actually weren't that thrilled that their daughter was leaving their home. And so the first question that I had to, uh, the first thing I had to overcome was, should a girl leave her home for school? And uh, I was super excited about IIT, partly because I, th I thought I could just leave home and party in IIT. So I was like, you know, kind of excited to go to Bombay. Uh, uh, eventually, my uh, parents kind of gave and uh, agreed to it, mainly because of a friend's mother who was very pro-women. She was like, oh, this girl's interested in engineering, you know, let her go and do things, let her, you know, get going. And then I ended up in IIT Mumbai. And what struck me is, and I think it still is the case, but it's much, much better now. When I went to Bombay, that was in the late 90s, or actually in the mid 90s, 92 to 96, there was extreme, and there still to some extent is, extreme imbalance between the amount of like the ratio of men versus women, right? We were 3%. So there were like 12 women in a batch of 330 people, I think. I think a lot of you guys, when you went to IIT, you know that, you know all the names of all the women, literally, right? Uh, and what does that mean for us women, right? It means that we have too few friends. I mean, compared to a guy, let's say they're an H2, H3, whatever, they know like 50 people instantaneously, they talk to all those people. We have like 10 friends at maximum. And then there's the other problem, which I think all of you know, we get a lot of attention, that's too much attention. Everybody knows everybody's name. Everybody knows uh, you know, what this girl is doing, how this girl looks, what she wears, what she doesn't wear. And this leads to a lot of problems actually. First, because everybody is so kind of pitted against each other, sometimes women don't get along with each other. There are points in H10 where there are like, you know, there are these enmities, there are friendships. It's a lot of drama. It's kind of like a Hindi movie uh, to some extent when you look at H10, at least at that time. I'm, I'm hoping now that problem has eased up. We, I think, have moved from 3% to 15%. So really good progress from the time I was there. Uh, and then the other big problem is you don't have people to work with you for labs. You don't have people to work with you for assignments. Uh, I mean, and in IIT, there's a lot of like collaboration that goes on. 
on. People learn from each other, understand from me, understand, um, you know, each other's way of thinking. Uh, also, kind of like learn how to solve problems. That's one of the biggest, like, kind of issue, uh, you know, kind of big things about IIT is how we work with each other, how we collaborate, how we have fun, uh, and that is kind of missed for most women. Having said all that, this was the best time of my life still. So I want to call that out and say, hey, uh, you know, I loved being an IIT. I did. I was a very social person, as is probably obvious to all of you. But um, for a lot of others, that wasn't the same, right? And like kind of understanding a women's journey, even today, I think a lot of these issues will resonate with a lot of women. Uh, I think for us, it's important as kind of an alumnus, as kind of a community of some very smart, very well-to-do and very... Um, you know, successful engineers and scientists and innovators uh, realizing that women go through this in all the top universities and schools is something which I think is the first starting point in terms of solving some of the problems that uh, we have when it comes to gender imbalance in STEM. So then after IIT, actually, I was uh, fortunate enough to go to a really great school, uh, which is Dartmouth, and then come to Silicon Valley. I was obviously very taken by California at that time. I really wanted to move here. I, I applied to a bunch of different places. I ended up at a, a company called um, Elance, which is now called Upwork. Uh, and luckily, that was a kind of like an almost an IIT feeder company. So it was started by two IIT people. And um, I, uh, I kind of really fit in really well. I, I mean, I was one of their early founding engineers. So I had a really good time and started realizing how, what is possible, you know, in terms of like, people can actually start companies, people can actually go off and like, you know, build out ideas and dreams and realize that. And that was a big deal for me. And then, uh, you know, I obviously saw Google come up early on. I tried to get into Google a couple of times, didn't get in. And then the, you know, third time I did. Uh, and so I was very, very happy to go to Google for what it's worth, even though Google gets a bad rep, it's one of the few companies, at least at that time, that really promoted women and women in engineering a lot. I actually learned a lot from Google. And then that's when I started thinking, okay, you know what? Uh, if Google can come up from nowhere to this being this huge, huge, um, you know, mover and shaker, it's kind of changed all our lives in, you know, in very, very, very big ways. Uh, can I also do something? Can I also like uh, do a little in terms of like starting a company? Also, I must tell you, I was kind of like very privileged. Uh, I, I am married to an IIT. And so I, I, you know, I met my husband uh, in IIT. That's, you know, everything about me is IIT in some ways. I, I met my husband in IIT. Uh, we both actually worked at Google together. He's one of the top engineers there is in the world. So I'm very privileged because, uh, you know, I also happen to be, uh, uh, he also happens to be my co-founder. So we both got together, started this company. Again, something which is not possible for a lot of women, if you think about it, you know, it's hard for them to find co-founders, even though they're really, really smart and brilliant. And so we were really, um, you know, excited to, uh, to be doing that. At that time, actually, the investors were very skeptical. In the first, our first round, first company, you know, we talked about post intelligence. We talked to all the top Silicon Valley firms. And there was this thing of like, oh, there's a women CEO. How is that going to work out? Two, are you going to have kids? If you're going to have kids, um, you know, will you be able to do the startup? And so there's a lot of like questions that were asked that I had to answer and overcome. Uh, and eventually, you know, I managed to. Um, answer some of those questions. I also had made up my mind at that time, or we as a, a couple had made up our mind, in some sense, not to have kids. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have kids and only then you can do startups, but it just happens to be the case. And so in some ways, that was a little bit easier for us. All, all I'm trying to highlight here is the kind of complexities a woman has to go through while she starts a company, especially in a deep, deep tech space, right? One, finding the right co-founder. Two, like, you know, us answering questions about, oh, when are you getting pre pregnant? And the problem is if there is imbalance in the market, these stereotypes are unavoidable. So the investors obviously want to make money for themselves they don't want to like kind of bet on things which they don't think are commonplace so that's kind of what is you know uh you know what is driving some of these biases in some ways so some of it is even unconscious and then my next company abacus is even more interesting because it's a really really um kind of a deep tech company i mean a lot of problems that we are solving is very hard very challenging and again that's again suddenly it's kind of like can a woman be a ceo of a deep tech company does she understand technology enough and so on and that has been um, an interesting journey uh, and uh, what we have done uh, to kind of like uh, you know solve that problem to some extent is I actually meet all my um, you know potential candidates. We have a really great um, 
team and I, I talk to them, I assure them, I don't say, hey, I'm a woman, I'm going to assure you. It's just that I'm like, hey, I'm the CEO. I think you should like have confidence in the fact that we'll actually do well. And so, um, and also tell the employees like, look, this is challenging and satisfying and you shouldn't really be kind of like, you know, one-sided and think that women can't do, um, uh, you know, can't do stuff. And I'm, you're seeing more and more women. Obviously that number has increased. Is it 50% today? No, it's far from it, but it's getting there. And there has to be concerted efforts to cultivate a culture of diversity. You could say why, you know, you could be like, why do we care? And the reason is actually women do bring things to the table, which kind of, let's just say, you know, even from a brain perspective that you can't get with just like a homogeneous society, right? Having people who come with different um, perspectives, but not just that, different ways of thinking. And the kind of like things that women do bring is kind of emotional thinking, emotional intelligence, which is so important to, you know, get the company to, um, succeed, get organizations to succeed. In fact, I joke around and say, women are really great at leadership positions. Men might be you know, good at engineering, but women are great at leadership positions. And you are going to see women being able to negotiate better. And you know, it's also never a gender game, so, so to speak. It's just that we want to make sure that we do have that kind of diversity, that kind of like, you know, uh, that kind of mix so that the company or the organization succeeds and you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have all perspectives to solve hard problems. And the other thing we've realized, at least, is you have to start an high school. A lot of women, especially in the United States, even don't even want to get into STEM positions, right? Because they're saying, hey, 90 percent of the time I'm surrounded by men. I don't want that. I actually want to hang out with women and have a good time uh, and like, you know, do something which is useful. I don't want to like be climbing this hard ladder. And so I. Uh, uh, we, especially at Abacus AI, have started an internship program. At any point in time, we have four women uh, interns who are like interning from high school or early college. Our, um, you know, motivation is to get them to be more um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, motivated by picking computer science as a major, more motivated, uh, more excited about AI and things like that. So that's kind of where we are at right now. And that kind of concludes my talk. I hope I haven't overrun my time but there we are thank you bindu for sharing all your stories you know behind the scene uh, all the details with us that was fantastic we have started to get audience questions so let's start with the first one uh, question from nidhi that was a great content and how do you see the role of men in putting women leadership in in front line to achieve equality that's a very good question. I think men and women have to like, you know, really kind of lean in, <laughs> borrowing Sheryl Sandberg's uh, like term there. But, you know, I think the first thing is realizing that they need women and they need women at the table, right? Without that realization, it shouldn't be like, oh, you know, I need to get one woman, token women into some like table and get them, you know, involved. It has to be like, oh, by having this women leader, I managed to get this done. Or And that happens only when you experience it, right? So the first thing is to say, hey, let's get more women leaders in. But then second, experience what women can do and then continue to feel like, uh, continue to drive towards a much more equitable uh, world versus just saying, hey, here is a reservation world. I think that's very important for men to do. Thank you for sharing that. We have more questions flowing in. So the next one is, what can founder CEOs do to create a culture of diversity, largely because most co-founders are from similar backgrounds and ethnicity? That's a very good question. Abacus is also becoming an IIT feeder, I don't know, for better or worse. Uh, so yeah, what we do typically is we try hard to like kind of go outside our comfort zones, at least look for people. Uh, because in the end of the day, you know, let's take AI. China is really coming up in AI, as all of us know, right? And so, you know, in some sense, there are some really talented people who come from the Chinese mainland and you want to be able to attract them. So if you don't do that, if you just become 90% or 95% Indian and all of them from IIT, we're going to miss out on that talent. So you have to go out of your way to keep thinking about that and looking at candidates who are from diverse backgrounds. Uh Thanks for sharing that. Another question is, uh, how can COVID changed things for you as a woman leader? What were the challenges you faced? Anything you changed about your leadership style, particularly during that period? 
Yeah, I think COVID has been a double-edged sword. There's lots positive about it too. You can like, right now we're doing this conference. I didn't have to go to San Jose, wherever it is, right? So you can get to like a lot more, uh, you know, people and talk to a lot of them. That's obviously been great for us as a startup as well. Negatively, um, it, it has impacted kind of, uh, you know, kind of real world interactions. You can build a relationship with someone within two days, right? If they're in the real world. Imagine hanging out with two people for like eight hours a day. I mean, by the third day, you're probably friends. And I think that's that's kind of the negative aspect of it. Net net, I do think it's positive because we are talking to so many more people across the world. We are interacting uh, on like various different digital platforms. And as a woman, I actually think it's slightly positive because when you see women in real world, people kind of like also kind of think uh, have that stereotype of oh she's a woman all the time in their heads, whereas digitally a little bit less so, right? So that's why I think it's a little bit more positive for women. Thanks. Uh, and the last question, what is one message would you like to leave with your especially women audience today, whether they are founders currently, aspiring entrepreneurs, women after 40 who are thinking of starting, but maybe they think it's late. What's that one message you want to leave your audience with? I think the, this, the world is your oyster today. Everybody is supporting women. More and more people are. So don't be afraid follow your dreams, and the world will help you. Uh, and yes, there are biases, but you know, we're all overcoming them. So it's a great time for women to, you know, literally follow their dreams, regardless what, of who. What a beautiful message to end your session with. Thank you so much, Bindu. I, it was so inspiring. Uh, thank, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye.